Hey, what's up, Fervent Church? My name is Mike Rosado, lead pastor here, and I'm excited that you are right here, right now, enjoying our Fervent online experience. I don't know where you're watching this from. Maybe you're watching this at a backyard tailgate, one of our collectives. What is a collective, you might ask? Well, a collective is a group of people in our church, 20-plus people that get together on a daily basis, virtually online. Um, they, they get together on Zoom once a week. They have parties. Some of y'all just had a party um, they, they watch on the weeks that we don't have in-person services. They watch together in their backyards and in their living rooms. And, and I love collectives. I am pro-collectives, if you haven't caught that. Why? Because you're not back into church until you're back into community, y'all. I mean that when I say it. Y'all think I'm just playing around. It's not a threat. It's serious right now. It, you're not back into church until you're back into community. We're not going to play the church game. And speaking of not playing the church game, we want to hear God's voice. And so we've been in this series called The Voice, learning how to hear from God. And I think an important feature on how to hear from God is learning how to pray. So here's my challenge to every single person watching today. Can you take off the expert prayer badge? All of you good Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts that grew up in church, can you take off the expert prayer badge? And let's just declare ourselves that we are not expert, that we still have room to grow, and we want to hear, we want to look into the eyes of Jesus today and ask him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And that echoes what the disciples asked in the text that we're going to use this morning. Luke 11 starts off this way, says, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, when, the, when he said teach us to pray, notice this, that they grew up praying. There were some good Jewish boys they, they understood the context. They understood the culture. So what they were basically saying is, Jesus, you're doing something different. You're doing something new, and we want that. This, whatever you're doing is going beyond religion. Whatever you're doing is going beyond routine. We want that relationship with the Father, just like you have. So teach us how to pray. And, and, and it, I love this part because it shows that um, how religion still kind of kind of perpetuates with comparison because he says, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples, right? And so they're, they're sitting there saying other people are, are, other people's, you know, rabbis are teaching them how to, other people's leaders are teaching them how to pray. Lord, teach us how to pray because I, we want to do what you're doing. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, let me three loaves. All right. Talk about that good Italian hospitality. I'm married to an Italian. And when she grew up, you know, her grandma always had that cake that's there, not for you. It's for guests. Right. It's for guests. So hospitality was a high value. Uh, here in this context. And so Jesus is hitting them right there in the middle of their society. He says, friend, let me three loaves for mine. Uh, for my friend has arrived on a journey. I have nothing to set before him. And he answered from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Yet because of his impotence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. I love that. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and the one who seeks, finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. What father among you, if the son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will it give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil... <laughs> Oh, sweet, precious Jesus. Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I love this because Jesus is teaching them how to pray. He's teaching them that God is a generous God. He's teaching them that we have to have a dialogue with God in order to receive from God. It's about the voice. I love the attachment of the Holy Spirit right at the end. He says, you know, if we're asking for the Holy Spirit, God is so good that he's going to give us the Holy Spirit. Um, there's, a, there's a gentleman 
uh, in our denomination. His name is Rob Reamer, and, and he says it best. He says that God has not given you a junior Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that lives in Pastor Mike is right there with you in your living rooms, in your backyards, in your car, wherever you're listening to this. He's right there with you. And if you ask God for the Holy Spirit, he's a good God, and he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. So we're going to learn in the next couple weeks how to pray. How to pray. We're taking off that expert badge. How to pray. So if you're with me today, say together in the chat, say, I'm here. I'm going to wait for you to type it. Say, I'm here. I'm ready. Draw me closer. Make me better. In Jesus' name. I, uh, this, the next couple of weeks is going to be uh, semi-emotional for me, if I'm honest with you. Uh, I had a grandfather who... Um, he had an addiction. He, he went to rehab. Um, I want to say a couple of times, but for w- one time in, in my experience with him, he went to rehab and um, in and out of rehab. And then when he got, got out of rehab, he started working for the rehabilitation center uh, in Delaware. And uh, he would come and visit us every now and then. And I remember b- before he passed away, um, he was leaving. He was getting back to the car to go back to Delaware and uh, at this time, I was already a pastor at another organization. And he asked me, he says, hey, hey, Michael. Um, he always said Michael. He didn't call me Mike. No, Michael, do you, uh, do you have any teachings? Because he took a couple of my sermon CDs and he goes, do you have any teachings on prayer? I, I, I want to learn how to pray. And uh, I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed because I did not have a teaching on prayer. And if I'm quite honest, I've never heard a teaching on prayer. I, everything I know about prayer, I have learned by observation. I have learned by going to prayer meetings. I have learned by how the pastor prays in service. I have learned um, just seriously just observing people. Um, no one's ever taught a teaching on prayer. And so I felt embarrassed, and unfortunately, um, this is kind of sad, and I don't want to bring your morning down, but it was, a, it was the last conversation I've ever had with him um, before he passed away. His, his question to me was, do you have a teaching on prayer? And ever since then, I've always had this weird relationship with prayer. I don't know if you, uh, you're with me here today. I want to know, like, I wish kind of like online, there's a, where's your level of honesty today, right? I'm, I'm going to take it up to 11 today in regards to my level of honesty. And um, I had a weird relationship with prayer because I know it's something that you're supposed to do. I knew it's something um, that, that, that is encouraged in the Christian faith and in and, and every faith, in fact, right? You, you see, we see all religions kind of have some form of prayer, uh, incorporated in their activities. And, and so, but I always had this weird relationship with prayer. Why? Because when it comes to prayer, um, I'm just going to be really honest right now. When it comes to prayer, I'm not in control. I'm not. Not in control. So I personally don't naturally prefer prayer. <gasps> oh my gosh, I can't believe my pastor is telling us this, but, but I'm going to be honest with you. I don't prefer prayer because I'm not in control. I don't prefer prayer because it's not instant. It's not instant. I don't, have, I don't get an instant answer. It's not like I wish it was almost like a text message so I could at least see the bubbles that God is working on answering me right now. Like I, it's not instant. I'm not in control. It's not instant. It doesn't, uh, uh, and forgive me, all right, so don't, don't comment right now. We're going to get to what this means, but, but I would say things like sometimes prayer doesn't work. It doesn't always work. And I had to learn through maturity and the bumps and bruises in life is that when I say God, like when I say prayer doesn't work, what I'm really saying, what I'm really saying is this, that, that God's not obeying me. <laughs> so the truth of the matter is I, I kind of figured out that God is always listening, but he doesn't always obey me. Let me say that again, because that's so real. That might have gone over your heads. That God is always listening, but he's not always obeying me. 
And as I mature, I'm realizing it's not about him obeying me at all. He's the creator. I'm the created. It's about me obeying him. So when I say it doesn't always work, that's what I really mean, that God's listening, but he's not obeying. And the other thing I don't like about prayer is that, like, I don't always feel something. You know, like some of the, some of the people who, who, who uh, like to show themselves to be super religious and holy, they always like, oh, I feel the presence of God. And I just, there are moments still to this day as I'm still pursuing God, as I'm infatuated and I'm in love with Jesus now than I've ever been before. But still there are moments when I pray I don't feel something. And I want to let everyone here off the hook and let you know that that's normal and that's okay. You don't always feel something when you're praying. But that's why I have a weird relationship with prayer. And if <laughs> the, the last one that I'll leave you with about in regards to my preferences in regards to prayer, because sometimes prayer is boring. I got to be doing something. I'm, I, and there are moments where, like, I know, we just talked about it last week, I know I'm supposed to learn to be still. But that gone it is boring being still. It is. I, I don't know if I'm just a hyperactive, you know, male. I don't know what it is, but it's boring sometimes. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it is exciting. Sometimes I do feel something. Sometimes um, it, it, it feels like it's working, right? That that for, for 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 out of luck, my petition to God is lining up with His will. It's not that He's obeying me, but it's in line with His will. So sometimes prayer is awesome, and but other times. I would say 70% of the time, I'm feeling all these feelings when it comes to prayer. Am I talking to anybody today? All right? And so we need to learn how to pray. And prayer is not an afterthought when it comes to Scripture. When we, when we read Scripture, it's not an afterthought. You know, there, there's so many prayers in Scripture. There's, there's so many prayers in the Bible that, that, in fact, there's 650 prayers in the Bible. 450 of them are, are there are actually 450 recorded answers to prayer. So isn't that crazy? There's 650 prayers, but only 450 answered prayers. Again, God is listening, but he might not be obeying you, and he's not supposed to anyway. There's 25 recorded prayers from Jesus. So, so if anything, if we're supposed to be Christians, if we're supposed to be Christ-like, then we're supposed to pray because Jesus prayed. 41 times, Paul, this man who wrote a large portion of of our New Testament, a large portion of the, the, the letters to the churches that, that, that came after the movement that Jesus started, 41 times he mentioned prayer. So what is prayer? Let's just start there. What is prayer? Older definitions used to say, well, it's a conversation with God. You've heard me talk about this before. Or it's just like talking to God. And it can't be accurate because... Um, there are times where some of us experience God in silence, where there is no dialogue. Come on, right now, if you're in the chat, like, just give me some emoji. Give me something where you've experienced God in silence. So sometimes it's more than just talking to God. It's more than just a conversation. So then what is prayer if it's not talking to God, if it's not talking to the Father? Let's define prayer in the next couple of weeks to say it's access to God. Prayer is direct access to God. We don't have to have anyone in between. It's direct access to God. It's important. And why is it important? Well, I already said this, that Jesus led the example in regards to prayer. He prayed. Why is it important? Even humanly talking, talking to some of us humans that are watching today. I say some of us humans because uh, some, some people send me pictures of their dogs watching online experience. So, so what up, pups? Right? But, but as humans, we, we have this instinctive response to crisis when it comes to prayer, don't we? we you've heard the saying, there are no atheists in foxholes. And so there's this in, in, instinctive crisis uh, that, that comes along our way every now and then as humans. And how do we respond? We respond in prayers, even for unbelievers. I've never had an unbeliever in the middle of crisis reject me saying, hey, I'm going to pray for you. Never once. Maybe you have, but I personally have yet to experience that. Why? Because there's this instinctive nature to us that wants to have access to God in the middle of crisis. 
I love this statistic. 99% of couples who pray together don't get divorced. Wow. 99% of couples who pray together don't get divorced. Somebody say prayer is important. It's so important. It's so important. Then watch this, that the, the, the Holy Spirit, that God himself, we believe that we believe in the Trinity here at Fervent Church. And, and if you don't believe in the Trinity, that's fine. You can still be a part of our community. But what we're going to impart from this stage on this microphone is the Trinity. We believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in a monotheistic, we have a monotheistic theology, meaning we believe in one God and three personal distinctions. And, and one of those distinctions is the Holy Spirit. And watch this, the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf. That's how important prayer is. He prays on our behalf. Romans 8, 26 to 27 says this, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he who searches hearts know what the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to to the will of God. Don't you love that? That it's so important that God himself, if you don't do it, if you don't know how to do it, if you feel like you're, you're too weak in the moment to pray, that God himself, God himself will fill in the gap and intercede and pray for us. That, my friend, is amazing. And that's why prayer is important. I want to talk about a couple myths in regards to prayer. Let's kind of kick some things over. Let's just bow, kick some things over today. Um, in regards to prayer. And here's the first myth. The first myth is this, that God doesn't listen to sinners or God doesn't listen to those who are unhealthy spiritually. That God doesn't listen to sinners or God doesn't listen to people who are unhealthy spiritually. I remember growing up hearing the term, God don't like ugly. (laughs) You heard that? God don't like ugly. And it would give us this impression that we cannot come to God with our head up high because something is wrong with us. And if that is the case, then we could never go to God. So it's a myth. It's a myth that God doesn't listen to sinners. One of the best stories is, again, I talked about a guy named Paul who wrote a large majority of the New Testament. Before he was Paul, he was this gentleman named Saul who was killing Christians, killing Christians, all right, murdering Christians. Christians, murdering people of the early church. And God, Jesus, had an interaction with him. You can read it for yourself in, in Acts 22, 7, where, where God, in the middle of his, his, his murdering, you know, uh, journeys and adventures of, of trying to just persecute the early church, God had an interaction. God had a dialogue with him and literally said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And it's not just in the New Testament, all in the Old Testament. We see God constantly rescuing his people, even when they're not healthy or when they're in the middle of sin. Psalm 18, 16 and 19 says this. He, he sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. Psalm 32, 7, he says this. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shots of deliverance. With shots of deliverance. Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord. He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. That sounds very unhealthy, but he delivered him from all his fears. Psalm 107, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. I love the fact that all throughout the Old Testament, all throughout Scripture, and I could tell you other stories where God had dialogues with people who were in sin or God had dialogue with people who needed to be rescued. And guess what? My God is still in the rescuing business. So the myth that he doesn't listen to us when we're in trouble, even when we're the ones that put us in that trouble, the, the, the myth that he doesn't listen to you unless you're the spiritual dynamo of a person is a myth. It's not true. He listens. He might not obey, but he listens. Second myth is that um, we need to pray more to get a response. Keep praying. Just pray more to get a response. Jesus himself said this in Matthew 6, 7, 8. We're going to kick over some religious stuff today. And he says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard 
for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. Then what's the point of prayer? The point of prayer is relationship. The point of prayer is intimacy. The point of prayer, the point of our access is to get close to God. It's to grow. It's to develop. It's to mature. But we, at times, think that if we just pray more, if like if we just become that nagging individual, you know, some of the parents, you, you ever had your kids that you have already answered them and they just keep asking and asking and asking them, what I say? What did I say? What did I say? I already said no. And they keep asking, thinking, and believing that they're going to change our minds. And unfortunately, you allow them to change your answer. But God's a good God, and he's stable, and he doesn't need to, to, to win our favor, right? And so he sticks with his word. He, he, he stays right there in the pocket. And so when, when we feel like, when religious has taught us that we need to pray more in order to get a response, then we're treating God as though he's just this genie in a lamp that's going to grant us our wishes. If, so if the only time we go to God is because we want him to grant our wishes, then we really don't want a relationship with him. We just want our wishes to come true. And the Father wants a relationship with you. You hear that? The Father wants a relationship with you. He's not a genie. He's a father. So that myth that you pray more to get a response is a myth. And here's another myth, myth, the whole name it and claim it thing. All right. So I want to be very clear with that uh, because sometimes people are like, aren't you like a name it and claim it? What is name it and claim it? Back in the day, uh, there was this movement uh, of bigger churches and, and, and it was a Pentecostal thing where people would just talk about wealth and and, and prosperity and all that other stuff, just name it and claim it, and people, you know, were getting rich and, 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 and saying that it was, it was a result of them naming and claiming it in prayer and, and those kind of things, and, and it became a movement, and then it died very quickly. Um, and so we don't, we, don't, we don't believe in name it and claim it here, and nor, nor do we believe that poverty is always holy, um, but, but we don't believe in name it and claim it here. Um, Matthew 6, again, that same chapter, Jesus is talking about prayer, and he says this, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus tells us that, hey, listen, so right after on the heels of him talking about prayer, he says this, this is where our priorities are. Our priorities aren't accumulation of wealth our priorities are heaven and the will of heaven and, and what, heaven, what, what God in heaven wants to do here on earth. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God is interested in bringing heaven down here to earth, and it's not about riches. and It's not about your glory. It's about his glory. Okay, so the whole name it and claim it thing, it's about us. So, so maybe, you know, I, I, I think I like the, the initial heart of it, how they kind of believe that that in the beginning they wanted to believe in a powerful God and believe that God is still the provider because he is the provider. So rather than naming and claiming it, instead let's think of believing and trusting in him, not it. Just get rid of the it. It's not name it and claim it. It's believing and trusting in God. That's what we believe in, and that's what tips over that myth. Here's another myth for you. Prayer from a particular people or a group of people move God to action. Prayers from a particular people or group of people move God to action. I used to always think, I used to, and, and there's nothing wrong with this, but, but when I feel like there was a crisis, I would jump on the line and call the people that were in the prayer ministry. There was a prayer ministry, and if I'm really honest with you, I'm not pro-prayer ministry. I don't want to compartmentalize something that's a part of, that should be a part of everyone's life. Hello? I don't want to compartmentalize. So that's why we call our worship team, like the creative arts ministry. We don't call it worship ministry because, to be honest with you, we're all in the worship ministry. We don't, we don't have a prayer ministry. We have a prayer dynamic. We don't even have a missions department. We have a missions dynamic here. Every, every single person watching, every single person that declares himself a part of Fervent Church, you, you are on mission. You are called to worship. 
You are called to prayer. It is not a department. It's a dynamic of every growing Christian. So prayers from a particular group of people move God to action is a myth. And it's something that, again, I, I watched and observed, but it, it's nowhere in the Bible. Galatians 3, ever since Jesus stepped onto the scene and liberated us from the bondage of, of sin and, and, the, and we're into this new covenant. You know, Galatians 3.28 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek neither slave nor free, there's neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offsprings, heirs according to promise. Come on. All right? So God doesn't favor certain races. God doesn't favor certain sexes, right? He, he, we have complete access. We're all heirs to the kingdom of God. And so certain people's prayers don't move God to action. We are his children, period. We are his children, period. So prayers from a particular group, it's not a a prayer ministry. It's a dynamic that we all should have. You have access to the Father. Last myth is fasting moves God. We're real quick to to real jump on the whole, like, well, you know, if prayer's not working, then add some fasting to it. Um, and let me help you out with this. This is really important. Um, I had to learn this because at times when I really, 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 really wanted something, notice what I just said there. When I wanted something, I fasted. Oh, let's fast. Let's fast together. That's what we really want. Let's fast. Um, but I want to correct our hearts on this, okay? Fasting does not manipulate God. Write that down. Fasting does not manipulate God. Fasting changes us, not God. Fasting is not a way to appear more spiritual than others. Fasting is to be done in a spirit of humility and a joyful attitude. Jesus said, man, if you're fasting, put some oil on your face and don't even look like you're fasting. Right? It's not about you looking more spiritual. It's not about you manipulating God. Fasting doesn't change him. Fasting changes us. We see the same prayer that Jesus taught in Luke 11. And we see it again in Matthew 6. And then again, listen to what he says. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into the room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for their Father knows what you need before you. And ask them, pray then like this. And then we see the Our Father again. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Right now, if you're a former Catholic like myself, you're, you're tempted to cross yourself right after you, you do that. But let me challenge us with something. Notice he said, pray like this. And notice, what, what was the question that the disciples asked? The disciples asked, Father, teach us how to pray. Notice, notice that they didn't ask, Father, teach us a prayer. Oh, y'all got to get this. Notice that he didn't say that. He didn't say, Father, teach us a prayer. He says, teach us how to pray. And then he says, pray like this. He said, pray like this. But we think he taught us just a prayer. And when prior to this, he says, do not say empty words. So let's talk about this real quick. What, 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 what are some of the things that we don't do in prayer? All right? We do not pray to anyone else but God. We don't pray to anyone else but God. And why that's really important, because especially at times I've watched when uh, you're in these prayer meetings and after a while, it's just, it's, it, it doesn't look like you're praying to God. It looks like you're preaching to the room. 
We, we, don't, we don't pray to anyone but God. Again, and if you're, you're a recovering Catholic like myself, we don't pray to Mary. We don't pray to the saints. We pray to God. John 14, 6 says, this is, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said it very clearly, no one goes to the Father except through me. So when you pray, we, we don't pray to anyone else but God. Another thing, when we pray, we don't pray contrary to his will. What is his will? His will is that none shall perish. What is his will? His will is that we shall worship him, right? We don't pray contrary to his will. 1 John 5, 14 to 15 says this way, and this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we, that, that we have the request that we have asked of him. So he answers, he responds, he moves according to his will, not ours. So when we pray, we need to focus on, we need to try our best to pray, not according to our will, but according to his will. And that's hard. And how do I learn his will? Honestly, I learn his will by learning his word. Hello. I learn his will by learning his word, right? What, is, what, were some of the, what are some principles that I could derive from his will? I gotta get it from his word. I got to get it from his word. And so that's why it's important to get into his word. That's why it's important to, to study and to understand what is the heart of the father. Because if I understand the heart of the father, then I understand the will of the father. And then I could pray according to his will and not contrary to his will. Another th- we're, thing that we don't do during prayer, we don't pray dishonestly. How dumb is that? And I've done this. How dumb is that, that we pray dishonestly? That we have the audacity to put on this front for God who knows everything? Does that make sense? But don't pray dishonestly. I, I, I love this when, when in Scripture talks about where uh, there was a comparison of prayer. Jesus was telling the story about a comparison of prayer. And one of the men said, one of the guys says, God, I thank you that I'm not like this other man, this other man over here. And the truth of the matter is like, you're, you're being dishonest to God. You are exactly like that man. You're a sinner equal to that man. But we're so dishonest in our prayers. God, you know, you know, you know all I want is you. My wife, she describes prayer as uh, talk. It's like talking to your father. And I like that because it's intimacy and authority. It's not like talking to your friend because sometimes you could disrespect your friend. Um, But when you're talking to your father, it's intimacy and authority. And then you add the layer of that he knows everything. I, I, I know when, I, you know, I'm not perfect at it, but I know when my boys are lying to me. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm God, but in, you, in this analogy, um, man, it, it annoys me. It annoys me when I know, I know darn well they are lying through their teeth. And they're not coming to me. And I love the fact that they are coming to me out of intimacy but also come to me with respect and live under my authority that I know you're lying to me. So come talk to your father, but be honest and truthful. Don't pray dishonestly. He told us already, Jesus said, when you pray, don't pray to be seen. Now, I'm not saying that we don't pray together in a group, but what I'm talking about is let's remove the performance out of prayer. Prayer is not a performance. Read last week the verse in Ecclesiastes where it says, let your words be few. Prayer is not a performance. Especially in the Christian world, I watch people that, that, that their prayers are so, so perfect. And that's great, and I'm not judging them at all. But I know for me and myself, as I practice, as I've made prayer performance, and, and, and as I've, I've learned to, to pray well up here on this platform, if I'm honest and I could confess my sin, that I've had deep words and a shallow heart. Deep words and a shallow heart because I'm praying to be seen. Or, you know, I would, I would categorize this under, under this point is that those emotional prayers, those emotional prayers can be really performance-driven. Those emotional prayers um, that, that, that drive us to, to scream and yell and and get loud. And, and sometimes that's appropriate. It is. The Bible does talk about shouting and, and praising God. And, and, but there are moments where it's based, it's more hype 
than it is substance. Am I being too honest today? It's more hype than it is substance. And emotions aren't bad. And emotions are bad. There's a, there's a pastor friend of mine in, in, in Maryland, and uh, he said this. He said that everything that's emotional, everything that's emotional isn't bad, but everything that's emotional isn't necessarily spiritual. Everything that's emotional isn't bad, but everything that's emotional isn't necessarily spiritual. So remember going back to one of the reasons why I don't really prefer prayers because sometimes I don't feel it. Well, that's okay because not everything that's emotional is spiritual. Another thing that Jesus told us not to do with prayers is pray empty prayers. You know, those long prayers. Has anyone ever challenged you to like, you know, how long do you pray? Why does it matter how long do I pray? When the Bible tells me to let my words be few, that, that, uh, that my words, they could be, you know, that the quantity could be, could be small, but they could still be meaningful. And sometimes, oh, I prayed for five hours. What, what were you doing? What were you saying? Right? Was it constantly empty prayers, you know? And, and so let me kick this over, and I'll say this. I don't pray before every meal because the Bible doesn't really mandate it. It says to give thanks before every meal, but it doesn't say to pray before every meal. And I'm, I try to teach my boys and I try to teach my family that let's not pray empty prayers, you know. Um, when we pray, when we, when we go to God, when we access the creator, I don't want to do it just to, like, bookmark our meals, right? Or bookend our meals. Or we do it for meetings, too. Like, we got to start off a meeting with prayer. We got to end a meeting in prayer. And at times, not all the time, sometimes they're very meaningful and very sincere and very authentic, and that is beautiful. I'm talking about those prayers that we just do it just to feel holy, and we don't even remember what we prayed for. They're just meaningless, empty prayers. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that because I want to revere God. I want us all to live under his authority. And so if we're accessing the creator, let our words be few. And even if though they're a small amount of words, let them mean something. But do not pray empty prayers. Do not pray without being under his authority. And again, somehow we convinced ourselves that intimacy and authority are enemies. And they're not. Just like our interaction with our father, if you have a healthy relationship with your earthly father, there's authority and intimacy go hand in hand. They're not polar opposites. And so we need to be under his authority when we pray. So, so you know, we say the phrase prayer works, but when we say prayer works, what we really mean sometimes is that, that prayer, that God did what I wanted him to do when we say prayer works. But prayer doesn't work for you, it works in you. Prayer doesn't work for you, it works in you. Sometimes, oh, get this. Sometimes the thing that we desire in prayer is just information. If you're praying just for information and not transformation, we're missing out on the purpose of prayer. Because if you're going to God just for information, this is what we're really asking him to do. We're asking God either give me information or change the information, but I'm not coming here for you to change me. But the purpose of prayer isn't for, for it to work for us. The purpose of prayer is, is it to work in us and through us, but not always for us. So when you go to God for information, don't just come to him, just, just, just get information or God, change the circumstance, change the information. What if we tr- changed our posture, be under his authority and say, God, change me. I'm not going to you just for information. I'm going to you for transformation. Last one, pray for God. Don't, we don't pray for God to do something that's our responsibility. Oh, man. We don't go to God, we don't pray to God to do something that's our responsibility. Write this down, this is very important. You can't use prayer to replace your laziness. Should I leave on that note? 
you, you, you can't use prayer to replace your laziness. Sometimes we just, oh, God, you know, just show that person the love of God. Um, hello, you're God's ambassador. He already told you to be his ambassador. He already told you to go out into the world and make disciples and be a disciple. And how would they know if you're my disciples? They will know by your love. So you're praying for God to do something, and it's under your responsibility. Don't be the person to pray for people and not be willing to talk to them. We pray for people, but we're not willing to talk to them. What if you're the very answer to the prayer that you're praying? God, send someone to them so that they can know you. Um, hello, be somebody. Send somebody. No, you be somebody. Let's not pray for God to do something that's our responsibility. We're going to continue learning more and more about prayer next week, and I'm going to stop right there, but I want to close with this verse. This is a good verse because it talks about all the different types of prayers here, and it says 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. It says this, for all, for, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, which is a form of prayer, prayers, intercessions, when we're standing in the gap for other people, and thanksgivings be made for all people, all people, for kings, for presidents, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Maybe if we could be obedient to what Scripture just told us, and more specifically, he was talking to this young leader at the time. Can I urge you? Can I urge you? To pray, intercede, be thankful for all people. Let's stand in the gap for all people and watch God do some amazing things through our authentic prayers. Can we do that, church? And maybe God has moved you and you're like, oh, wow, that's real, and I want to be a part of that. That's real. I, I, I haven't heard prayer talked about like that, and that's really appealing to me. And, and I don't know where I stand with God but I want to know. So if that's you and God's moving on your heart, I want to pray for you really quickly. Father, I pray for that person that you're, you're, you're moving them closer to you. You're revealing your love to them. I pray that they receive your love. They receive that gift of grace and mercy. Let them know that you are a forgiving God and that you're willing to forgive everything they've done, everything they're doing, and everything they're going to do. And that, Father, we believe that you have authority. Jesus, you are Lord. So we step into salvation, believing that you are our creator, we're the created, and we follow you with all our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.